Coming up today on The Story. My men in the church, they all went to defend their homes. When you've got missiles and bombs and things on the horizon and the, the, the men in the church try to send their family to a safe place and then they go to the local checkpoint or the military mobilization place, they get weapons handed to them and they defend their town. That is something that you would not wish on anybody. The Story. G'day, I'm Jimmy Colfax. Welcome to The Story. Well, our guest today is once again Pastor Wayne Sheck, who's joining us from Ukraine and has been serving there as a missionary for over 29 years. Today, Wayne will share more of his life journey and more about what it's like doing ministry in a war-torn country. Last time, he told us how he came to serve in Ukraine when he was almost 18 years old and how he met his wife there. Now, we'll pick up the story as Wayne shares more about some of the fascinating ministry work he was doing before the war. Once again, Wayne's chatting with Eric Scatterbo. We should say, besides being a pastor, you're also a cricket coach, is that right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny. Um, when it dawned on me in Ukraine that, you know, I've given up the dream to be a fighter pilot. The only thing that I really lost was the chance to play cricket because I loved cricket. Yep. But then after 15 years in the country mm -hmm. and a Tasmanian calls me uh, from the next town and he says, hey, do you know that there are Indians that play cricket in Kiev? And it's like, oh, we've got to check this out. So we went to Kiev and as a kid, of course, we, we had – red ball, white clothes, it was white skin, long form out of the game, astro turf turning into turf, grass fields. And then uh, you turn up in Kiev and it's a soccer field that's all dirty from the huh. as, as snow is melting. It's a, it's not looked after well. There's some asphalt around that's oh, on wow. the outside. It's like there's a running track around it, um, broken glass and that sort of stuff. But oh, it's no. dirt. So it's dark skin, colored clothes, white ball, short format of the game, and this coconut mat on the ground, which covers up the, the divots un underneath. Huh. But when they tossed me this ball and I caught it, sorry to say, the, the, with the, the, the spiritual connotation, it was like being born again, again. <laughs> uh, so I got my childhood dream back, and uh, you can't see it here, but... Behind me, uh, you've got the, the the books and the bookshelf, but at the top of the bookshelf, there's like a couple dozen of trophies. And these are my cricket playing trophies from in Ukraine. So it's the Indians. They take the cricket culture with them. It's in their blood. Huh. And uh, through being uh, a simple, uh, committed, hard-playing cricket player, and then God opens up doors, we actually uh, have Ukraine's only dedicated cricket field in Ukraine, in our town here. And oh, so wow. Indian students that are studying medicine or engineering or, or whatever, mainly medicine, mm -hmm. they come from all over the country to have tournaments in our town. Oh, um, wow. And the record is 50, 50 Indians staying in our church building <laughs> uh, during wow. the tournament. And uh, yeah, so in, you know when you the Old Testament picture of coming to the tabernacle and you've got – You've got the aroma, right, of mm -hmm. the of the worship and uh, what's the English word uh, for the, the the incense? That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, as soon as someone comes to our church and you open up the door, you can smell the curries and the <laughs> Indian spices, and it's like, oh no, cricket season has started again. <laughs> so, but but I mean, as fun as it is to play cricket, it's also a ministry opportunity. So I'm a very simple person. Um, Jesus says that we need to worship God with everything that we have. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if we're doing things that we can't worship him in, then you've got to rethink your theology. I don't believe that there's a, a secular sacred divide. I think that Jesus lived where everything was, was worship and people saw that and it wasn't religiosity. So mm -hmm. everything that I do, I, I, I do with my full strength. I give glory to God. Um, I try to do things in faith and you love people and then everything uh, then is a result of, you know, both his supernatural work, but what's the atmosphere that you're creating? What, what are your values? Mm. And so, yeah, we became a, a magnet or a light on a hill 
that the Indians with their own struggles and clans and, and castes and that whole thing, they decided, hey, we can work with Wayne. And so mm -hmm. uh, they, they put some money uh, into that and started sending teams. And then guess what? Um, the politics was moved aside and we've got this. We, we had before the war a, a growing cricket uh, ministry, but I wouldn't call myself, uh, I may be like a, a chaplain or something. That's sort of, I'm this spiritual guy. One of my giftings is that we start something and if a Ukrainian or whoever comes along, then it grows. Mm -hmm. um, through this, we were hoping to get sports ministry coaches to come and join us. And actually, I have a young engineer who uh, is a, he's Scottish. He graduated from, uh, with an engineering degree to work mm -hmm. on our community transformation project where we turn plastic into uh, into fuel, plastic waste into fuel. That that's just a little something you do on the side. Oh, um, um, what can I say on the side? <laughs> so, um, as my gifting uh, was becoming apparent, uh, and you begin to see where what God's put in you already, um, maintaining a local church, um, we wanted to be a part of it. We wanted to inspire it, but not maintain it. Um, we have an entrepreneurial side that is growing where we believe in sustainable missions that we can use resources that are available to both financially support the local work, but disciple people by rubbing shoulders with them at the workplace. Mm -hmm. And because this society is not working well, there's lots of issues with waste. And actually in many of places around the world that are that haven't ha don't have what we would call a vibrant community of Jesus followers or an impact from the gospel. You have, you know, many of them are uh, are, are poor. Mm -hmm. uh, society doesn't work well, and they have huge environmental challenges that are mm -hmm. only getting worse. So we believe that through the way that I'm geared, that if God brings in the right people to take this, the, the projects to the next stage, we can see uh, environmental transformation workplace discipleship and then sustainable missions where we can then help finance but empower others that are already called to other places that also have these major problems but if mm. we can come in and empower them by starting something then we'll be able to see something um, significant happen if the lord wills quickly what are some of these different projects that you've done in the past and are doing now <laughs> okay so it all started when i inherited being the pastor and then and then we miraculously got this church building that it hadn't been heated for five years so we have you know five six months of the, the year that need heating and we had what felt like a hundred percent unemployment in the church so mm. if you can imagine the church that you go to or if you don't go to church could you imagine everyone on your street that doesn't have a job life would be very different very very different mm, um yeah. and the social welfare thing it, it's not like australia during covid where the government was just throwing money out at people to to keep them happy uh, during lockdown this is a place that has gone through systematic annihilations of millions of people over the mm. last hundreds of years so very different mind mindset so uh when it dawns on you that no one has a job there's very little income and now we have this huge uh, facility um, what do we do and so i was praying and it's like god uh, i'm i'm told the word the word of god in prayer that's what we do we do the word of god in prayer that's what missionaries are supposed to do but it's like these people are hungry they have no leadership they have no future there's no hope but they believe in jesus um that he saved them from their sins and that's a real theological challenge because in the end it's Jesus that takes us to heaven, you know, being born again. But um, it's not just a transaction. Life comes into you and then life needs to shine through you and go mm -hmm. into the darkness and it transforms. Mm -hmm. So we started with an experiment to do a biogas um, system, which was to take organic waste to create gas to heat the church building. That experiment flowed over to a biodiesel um, concept where we take a um, like French fry oil from McDonald's or, mm -hmm. or fish and chip shop. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we, it was amazing that um, we would, you know, we produced our own fuel and the church van drives past smelling like fried chicken. Like <laughs> not, not only are we these crazy foreigners that somehow miraculously got this building in the center of town, but everything that we do just smells like it should be eaten sort of, sort of thing. <laughs> um 
And then, of course, when we brought mushrooms out of the basement of the church where we were growing them there, um, suddenly it clicked with the locals because the church is pretty much a reflection or a picture of what's going on in society. We were inundated by hundreds of people wanting jobs. Well, I was going to say, so did these ideas, did they work? Did they create jobs? So they did create jobs, but it was, that, that was a revelationary moment for me. One was being released from the, there's the spiritual and there's the secular, but no, here it is. Um, I was created in this way. I grew up with my dad building a hovercraft in the garage of the uh, at the home in, mm -hmm. in Harvey Bay. So mm -hmm. my dad was a tinkerer and a thinker and a welder and an artisan. And it turns out I'm not an artisan. Working with my hands is not the thing, but I definitely have ideas. Yeah. And so here in Ukraine, you could see so many things that could and should be done um, no one's doing them. Later on, as you start to do things, you discover why no one's doing them. And that's a part of the journey that you're on. But um, that that thing of, you know, uh, the, the contrast of the picture of the, the concerts where, you know, they shut us down. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, how do we get access to people? And then here it is, you've got this, it's like the Samaritan woman at the well where she's gone off and she's run, you know, she's gone off to tell the town and the, the disciples turn up and Jesus says, look, you know that thing about the harvest? Well, turn around, look at them, here they come. Hmm. And so it was like the streams of people coming to us wanting a job. They were wanting something. They were, they, they, there, was a, there was a journey of um, the Christians have hope. The Christians are doing something. Hmm. There's something practical here yeah. and it can at least help help feed my family mm -hmm. so that's when that when that penny dropped um it's like okay god was like you wanted access to people's lives here it is this is what you do so yeah we we've done a major mushroom growing uh, thing and we learned a lot and we had to put that aside um temporarily the biodiesel grew and we had 35 tons of of oil a month and that oh, was wow. doing great until until the revolution in 2014 and then the war, and I just knew that that project was going to stop, and it eventually did. And then the next thing was this project of transforming municipal solid waste, in particular plastic, into mm -hmm. a viable fuel. Just because biodiesel, the only way you can use it is if you have if you're frying something and you've got oil left over. Whereas waste is a worldwide phenomenon, and it's mm. getting worse. Mm -hmm. And plastic is plastic all over the world. So we started working on um, a technology, our own version of that, that would turn um, this uh, waste into a resource of, of energy and fuel and, and uh, open the doors for, for other things. So that project has been growing over the last eight years. And uh, if the war didn't start, we would have launched this last year. But now um, uh, we're now gathering internally displaced people. So my mm -hmm. my my men in the church and the men at the work site they all went to defend their homes. Mm. Uh, I I just just when you've got missiles and bombs and things on the horizon and people coming to your church in droves and you're helping them, the 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 men in the church try to send their family to a safe place and then they go to the local checkpoint or the military mm. mobilization place. Mm -hmm. They get weapons handed to them and they defend their town mm. that is that is something that you would not wish on anybody mm -hmm. um you know a husband kisses his wife goodbye she drives off and he walks in to to grab a gun to to defend his house just a few kilometers away so that that the, our lives have been turned upside down um uh, significantly but now a year on some of my key guys are in the military preparing to head to the eastern ukraine um, others are being called up. Others have already been discharged and administering to wounded soldiers in the hospitals. Hmm. Amazing ministries. We're all involved in some sort of trauma ministry. You're listening to The Story. Today, Eric Skadabo is once again chatting with Pastor Wayne Sheck, who's joining us from Ukraine, where he's been serving as a missionary for over 29 years. We'll hear more about doing ministry work in a war-torn country when we return. The Story. 